I am the medical director for Region 3, and I help a lot out with Region 5. Uh, Jeannie Pritchett here at Colorado Access is the medical director for 5 and is not able to be with us tonight. And um, I I'm not going to go over all of these mission, vision, values, and goals and strategies, but I'd like for you to ponder and just take a quick look at them when you return to your practice and just remember that when we're in this room, when we're sharing best practices, we are all in this together. This is not about one entity versus another. It's not about someone having the edge over another practice. It's about being the tide that raises all boats by sharing equally. And we as a group created a charter two years ago and we <coughs> present it for your remembrance every time we host one of these meetings. And so now we're going to kick it off to Dr. Paul Malinkovich, the Director of Ambulatory Care Services at Denver Health. And Paul's going to introduce a little bit about the CMMI grant that although you guys didn't all get a CMMI grant, there are some learnings that every practice, no matter how large or small, can take away about um, uh, how Denver Health is using new tools in this grant. We're really excited to be here, and we're really excited to talk to you about some of the stuff we're doing at Denver Health to, uh, that I think is transferable to practices uh, throughout any primary care practices. And when Deb said uh, uh, we got a grant at the hospital, we actually got a grant uh, at, at Denver Health mostly to do work not in the hospital. I mean, most of our work is actually focused on what we can do in primary care. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about our, uh, I mean, we were fortunate to have some uh, more funding than we, uh, uh, than many people have to be able to do some changes and to innovate how we're doing primary care. But this is really uh, uh, a, a, a transformation of how we're trying to do care at Denver Health to better manage a population of patients. And the populations of patients that we manage are our RICO patients, but we also have a managed care contract with the state, so we have a number of Medicaid patients who are actually in our managed care plan where we have a, a, a total, uh, we're responsible for the total cost of their care. So, so we, we have a grant from the Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare Innovation, and uh, I won't talk a lot about the funding, but it was a great opportunity for us to apply for and we received funding, and we're calling this our 20, 21st century model of care. And we really have three uh, main goals. This is a three-year grant uh, that uh, allows us to hire staff to, uh, and to change the way we practice uh, to really improve access to care. So our goal is over the next three years, we would add 15,000 new patients uh, to our population of patients. These are uninsured patients, as well as Medicaid patients, as well as CHIP patients, and Medicare patients. We have about 120,000 uh, annual users right now, so we were hoping to go up like 35, 140,000. The other goal is to improve the health of that population of patients. So not just to bring more patients in, but to improve our quality scores for those patients by about, uh, but we're using an index, and so we're hoping to raise that index by about 5%. The other thing that we're really focusing on is doing a lot of work in between visits. And so we believe uh, that we would be able to improve patients' satisfaction with the care they've received, not face-to-face -face with us as providers, but in between our visits. And then the third thing, that, which is what really CMS cares about, uh, most of all, is that they want us to reduce the total cost of care to that population. And we didn't say we would reduce the cost of care as much as we would lower the increase. And we said the cost of care would be 2.5% less relative to the trend of what we would, we would assume. And then we would actually, in doing this, save CMS about $12.8 million over a three-year period of time. So this is kind of conceptually how we've thought about uh, redesigning care. And if you think about how we do care right now, which is the way we have done care for ever since I've been around doing care, I hate to tell you how long I've been doing it, uh, and I won't admit, but uh, it's been a long time, but basically, we have a, a one-size-fits-all fits all method of care. So every patient who comes into our care gets the same thing. Uh, we rely almost heavily on, entirely on doing patient visits face-to-face -face and doing nothing in between visits. And we, we said to the patients, you've got to navigate the system. We've got clinics here and clinics here and clinics here. And we've got referrals over here. And oh, if you're a kid that needs certain services, you've got to go to Children's. 
you figure out how to get there, right? Uh, we don't use our HIT systems very well. And we mostly use doctors and nurses to do our care. And we don't get a great outcome from that. I mean, really, the outcome we get is it costs a lot. And if you compare us to a lot of uh, industrialized nations, we don't get great health, health outcomes. And the idea is that with, with this 21st century care grant, we would actually put these things into a nice, neat puzzle where uh, around patients and family, we tailored visits so that not everybody got the same visit, but the patients needed more got more to visit. Patients who needed less got less. We would really focus on the AAA, and we'd use a really diverse team of people to provide the care. It wouldn't just be doctors and nurses. It would be allied health practitioners, behavioral health consultants, patient navigators, social workers. And we'd really think about how we can integrate both physical health and behavioral health, because we think that's a key thing to actually achieving our, our goals. Uh, so next. So the theoretical basis for this, and I think most of you know about Wagner's, uh, Ed Wagner's chronic care model. Is everybody familiar with the chronic care model and how you use the chronic care model around disease? So we really use that not just for disease care, but for wellness care as well. And, and everybody knows about patient-centered medical homes. So what we're really doing with this grant is we're building on the chronic care model and the patient-centered medical home to really create what we would say is a patient-centered medical home on steroids, where we could really do a lot more for patients than we would normally do. The assumptions that we have is that if we had good teams that were well-prepared, activated patients, and a health system that supported that, we would actually be able to save money and provide better care. What The other thing that we've done a lot, I mean, really, if you're going to save money, in this intervention, you're going to save money by using primary care and what you can do in the primary care setting to keep patients out of the hospital. So the same sort of things that, that the RICOs are trying to do, reduce unnecessary hospitalizations, reduce unnecessary emergency mobilization, reduce unnecessary specialty visits and, and uh, diagnostic procedures. I mean, that's really the theoretical model we're using and the assumptions we were making about how we would save money. And then in terms of whether or not we would save money, it, it is entirely dependent upon how we get paid. So if we're still paid fee for service, we're not saving any money by not doing a hospitalization. I always say if we want to make money, we should stop doing birth control because in fact we could do a lot more deliveries at the hospital because we make a lot of money when we do a delivery. That's not the right thing to do, but that's how we make money. In a capitated environment, it's different. And so the assumption is if we were, if we had uh, patients assigned to us and we were paid in a different way, we'd be able to actually save money. I think the, this is my next, this is my, the next one is my last slide. So we looked at, and this is what Tracy's going to talk about, is the tiering of how you could identify patients who were high cost and low cost. And when we looked at all of our patient population, small number, like 1,200 patients were in this highest tier. They cost us $54,000 a year in total cost of care. Then we have a whole bunch of patients, almost 80,000, that only cost us $742 a year. And so the idea is you would design services in a way that for those people who had really high needs, we had special teams. And we've created uh, special clinics for them where they uh, would get very intensive care to keep them out of the ER and out of the hospital. We've had added resources to our patient-centered medical home for this higher tier, like patient navigators, nurses, nurse case managers, pharmacy consultants who can help with care management and, 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 uh, and medication management. And then as you get lower down the tier, we added less because we felt that the patient-centered medical home really could take care of everything these patients needed. So that's the theoretical basis of what we're trying to do. And I think uh, a lot of the things we're doing, certainly in this tier, this tier, and this tier, are things that every practice could do. I think this requires a lot more resources to set up a special clinic for really high-need patients. But we're going to share with you some of the things that we're doing.